you, know, you kind of go through life, at least I always have, and I think most people, just kind of assuming that, you know, especially in the middle of your life, you know, you're just gonna, everything's good. And uh, so to, all of a sudden, you know, boom, everything changes. It was like night and day, right, between kind of a casual, ah, we'll figure out what's wrong, to holy crap, right? <laughs> we, now we have to keep you alive um, long enough to get you into surgery. You know, what are you going to do? You curl up in a ball and, and uh, withdraw from the world or, or just, you know, keep living? Uh, that was, what, July 24th or 25th, something like that. I was actually speaking at a uh, local user group and uh, we had pizza. And so I thought it was uh, some heartburn, just it was a shooting pain came out of the center of my chest up into my uh, neck area. And uh, I thought, wow, this is some serious heartburn. You know, cheap pizza to use a group, right? And uh, so I, I apologized to the um, people that were at the user group. I said, yeah, I might have to even sit down. So I, I did and finished my talk. Um, from a seated position because it hurt pretty bad and I thought, wow, you know, this is uh, pretty painful, but it, I, I just credited it to the pizza. What happened, fin user group finished, um, there's a grocery store near to the office and so I went over there and uh, got some Tums or Gas X or I don't know what it was, but, you know, figured, well, I'll fight the heartburn, so I chewed some tablets as I drove home and uh, in, in retrospect, you know, every now and then you hear about those uh, disastrous things where somebody has a heart attack while driving, and I'm, I'm sure I was on the cusp of that. But yeah, I got home and it, the uh, heartburn medication did nothing at all, so I was still, you know, quite uncomfortable. And, uh, but still, you know, I, I just never, this whole thing didn't occur to me right away, right, that it could be something serious. And what I learned out of all this, and, and this is probably maybe the single biggest thing that I got out of the whole experience, is that there's no meaningful difference between heart attack symptoms and heartburn symptoms. I mean, I always heard that they were similar. There is no difference at all. The only difference is that if your um, heartburn medication doesn't have any effect, you're probably having a heart attack. I went back upstairs and woke up my wife and said, I think you better take me to the ER. And uh, she's like, okay, off we go. Because, you know, like most guys, I'm not a, you know, given a choice, I would never go to a doctor, right? So, um, you know, I tell my wife I need to go to the ER, and she's like, oh, it must be serious, right? So, and of course, the ER, you know, if you tell them you're having chest pain, whoop, right in you go. None of their tests showed that I was having a heart attack. This was the puzzling thing. The uh, ER doctor came in and said, well, you know, basically we, we can either send you home because there's nothing obvious going on, or you can stay in the hospital and tomorrow morning we'll do a stress test, uh, which basically means they put you on a treadmill and have you run while you're hooked up to a, a monitor. There was a lab technician who was looking at the blood tests, and, and in fact he was the guy that would have done the stress test and he noticed that one of the blood tests was slightly anomalous and uh, it could indicate that there was a clot in a lung or something like that. And so he said, boy, you know, really to be safe, this guy should have a CT scan before he does the stress test. And the CT scan is actually what revealed the aneurysm coming out of my heart. And if I would have done the stress test, it almost certainly would have burst the aneurysm. And so I mean, this is like, you know, edge of the knife sort of, uh, of stuff, right? If that one guy had not seen that one anomalous value on the blood test, I probably would have uh, uh, gone on the treadmill and that would have been the end of it. They did the CT scan, which clearly showed the, the aneurysm and the, uh, what's called a dissection. And uh, uh, immediately everything changed whoosh, off I went down the, the hall. I mean, it was, in fact, my wife barely got to kiss me goodbye because they're rushing me down. It was like a movie, <laughs> I kid you not. I think you either panic um, or, or you don't. They were suppressing my blood pressure as much as possible. Um, 
and uh, which of course is challenging because whether you're overtly panicking or not, your adrenaline response kicks in and raises your blood pressure, which is exactly what they don't want. Um, so they had me on some pretty powerful um, medications to lower my blood pressure. Well, they tell me the surgery was about four hours um, and then two or three hours more before I woke up. Um, and honestly, even then, I don't, it was much longer before I remember anything clearly. They uh, uh, put me on a heart-lung machine so my heart wasn't doing any of the work. Um, and uh, but then to do all of this, uh, you know, they pack ice around you to basically induce hypothermia and slow your body down so that there's less and less pressure on the heart-lung machines and on your body. And uh, then they uh, open up the sternum, so you know, it's, it's open chest surgery, uh, and uh, you know, cut out a chunk of the aorta and replace it, um, and then they wire your chest back together, and uh, you know, it sounds pretty horrific. <laughs> Um, the, the short form is called a triple A with dissection, but it's an ascending aortic aneurysm. So that's the chunk of your aorta that comes uh, out of your heart going up. It feeds you, well, it feeds everything, your brain, your lungs, you know, all the blood goes through there. And um, a dissection means that, uh, it turns out, I became, I wouldn't say an expert, but I got well educated here. Um, your aorta, um, of course is round, but it's actually got three layers to it. And a dissection means that one or two of the innermost layers have somehow ripped free from the um, outer layer and are uh, um, flopping around in there, I guess, for lack of a better word. And in this case, the, the two inner layers had, had torn free. And so the blood was flowing um, between the second and outer layer, and the outer layer was not strong enough to handle it all by itself, so it was bulging out, which is, of course, an aneurysm. Yeah, it was pretty dire. After the first surgery, I think I was in the hospital about a week. Um, yeah, I, again, I, comparatively, I'm still pretty young. You know, usually these major heart events occur to people that are, are substantially older, you know, like late 50s, 60s, 70s. And uh, you know, so, and I was in pretty good health, you know, fairly active lifestyle, and so I bounced back, uh, you know, relatively quickly because they, they said sometimes people are in the hospital for a week, sometimes two or three, uh, but I was in the hospital for one week. There was no damage to my heart at all. They did not have to replace the uh, uh, heart valve. It was just a chunk of artery that they replaced with something stronger than what I had originally, so they were like, yeah, you're gonna, you know, should be able to recover and go back to doing anything you ever wanted to do. Um, and uh, so they put me in something called cardio rehab, which is a type of uh, physical therapy. They have you uh, lift some weights and walk on treadmills and, and they, while you're hooked up to a heart monitor, just to make sure that you're, you know, recovering and, and uh, I guess that started maybe two or three weeks after the surgery, because there's, there's a period of time you just have to let the sternum, the bone heal and so forth. Well, it <laughs> sounds horrible to say this, but normally the uh, AAA with dissection, the ascending aorta, is discovered post-mortem. Um, more often than not, the aneurysm bursts um, and uh, the ambulance shows up and, and uh, uh, the person's already gone. So um, I'm pretty fortunate that, that, that it held on long enough for me to get to the hospital. Well, the second one was in some ways worse than the first. It was more painful. Um, so this was about five weeks later and, and I was feeling really good. I was starting to, you know, well on the road to recovery. Um, I was on, not only on the treadmill, but I was running and, you know, um, uh, I, you know, feeling quite good, and uh, um, but I was just uh, I was at home at the time, and uh, I just had this uh, really bad back pain that kind of spread through my whole chest, and I thought, well, this is not good. Um, it didn't feel exactly like the first uh, event, but it you know uh, it was similar, only much more painful, and so I called nine one one, 
and uh, you know, my wife was at work. You know, we, we all thought I was on the road to recovery, right? Uh, well, the second event occurred on September 11th, uh, believe it or not. <laughs> and uh, so the uh, police and ambulance EMTs came and, oh man, it was uh, incredibly painful. And uh, so they, uh, you know, put me in the ambulance, whooshed me off to the uh, hospital. And this, the second event is uh, what's called a type B dissection. <laughs> Uh, basically, it means that your uh, the aorta that goes um, down through your chest and abdomen. Uh, if, basically, it's the piece of your uh, aorta that feeds your legs, your kidneys, your uh, um, uh, your, your whole abdominal area. Um, that had dissected. So, and that's I think why it was so much more painful was because it, you know, the first dissection was only uh, um, I think they said four centimeters or something. But this one goes all the way from the top of my chest down uh, to the where the blood vessel splits off to each leg. But because this is such a uh, a, a long dissection, uh, basically surgery was more risky than doing nothing. So they said, "Boy, you know, if we try to go in and, and fix it, the risk of cutting off the blood supply to one of your lungs or one of your kidneys or one of your legs is really high." And uh, so it's probably a lower risk thing to do nothing at all except keep my blood pressure extremely low. And so what they did again is uh, suppress my blood pressure as much as possible, uh, lowered my heart rate, and uh, basically just had me lay doing nothing for about a week. You know, logically it seems likely that the second one is related. Um, like they said, it's, it's possible that I've got some uh, sort of genetic weakness uh, or, or, you know, fluke, whatever. Um, it's also possible that when they uh, um, replace the chunk of artery that, that the top suture, um, you know, somehow tore free and, and, you know, tore down through that, the rest of the artery. Um, it's really hard to say uh, which was the cause of it. They don't know yet what caused it. They're, they're doing a couple genetic tests because they're are one or two possible conditions that are pretty rare um, that can lead to this. Um, the most common causes for the, the whole problem are uh, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, um, which I had both, but I was being treated for. Uh, I'm 48, so I guess it's all relative as to whether you're old or not, but I don't feel old. Well, at this point, fully recovered now means something different. Um, because I'll no, no longer uh, like fully recover. Uh, this dissection will be with me you know, forever. I've got to, for the rest of my life, keep my blood pressure um, pretty low. Yes, I, I do go to cardio rehab uh, usually three times a week, and uh, eventually I'll stop doing that, but right now um, they want to make sure that as I'm uh, you know, walking more and, and lifting some weights and so forth, that my blood pressure doesn't spike, or, or my heart be, uh, my heart rate stays low. My wife's name is Teresa. Uh, my oldest son is Tim, and my younger son is Marcus. And then I've got a goddaughter who's really like a daughter to me, whose name is Amanda. My wife um, does best when she's able to uh, stay kind of uh, focused and, and being able to do something. And so through parts of this, there was nothing to be done, of course. Um, but through a lot of it, uh, there has been. I've needed a lot of uh, you know, support uh, and help doing a lot of different things that I would have normally done. And I think that helps a lot. Um, my older son and my goddaughter are both at college. And so I think it was hard for them because they couldn't, they weren't there, right? Or you know, they came to see me in the hospital, but they had to go back to school. Um, and my younger son, you know, similarly, it's, it was hard. He, like he said, he spent a lot of time with friends. and uh, you know, he's, uh, All my kids have got good support networks, which I think helps a lot. You, you know, you gotta get on with life. Um, I I'm, I'm always have considered myself extremely fortunate that I get to do the, the what I really love. I, I love technology and I love talking to people. Um, I, I love teaching. Um, and so, in fact, one of my biggest fears was that um, 
I would be unable to uh, go back into the outdoors, which I also love, or be unable to go to conferences and, and speak and, and interact with people. Uh, and uh, and uh, you know, there's a lot of trepidation for me to fly here, in fact, because uh, you know, this, is a, this is the first time I've ventured outside of my immediate support network and away from where my doctors are. And you know, um, So I know my wife is uh, fretting about that. <laughs> Um, but, uh, and, and I was a little nervous as well. Probably the single biggest thing is that I have a hard time getting through a day without taking a nap. Um, and hopefully that'll get better as I regain uh, strength and stamina. But um, right now between the medications and the fact that I've lost so much muscle mass uh, through this whole thing, um, you know, I get tired pretty quickly. Uh, beyond that though, um, yeah, I'm, I'm back, I'm able to drive again, so I'm able to go into the office or, or uh, as, as we can see, fly uh, to conferences. And, um, so to a large degree, um, kind of the day-to-day -day life is back to normal. But at the same time, um, yeah, you know, I'm a big guy and I've, I've always been kind of the, uh, I don't know, you want something heavy lifted, I'm the guy that can do it. <laughs> and, and that's not true anymore. It probably uh, it may never be true, I don't know. You know I tell you what, when, when uh, something like this happens and, and you get this amazing outpouring of support, uh, you know, people that are close, were, you know, it, was, it was tangible support. Um, people bringing food or coming over and you know, just helping make life work. Um, or, or an outpouring of uh, support from people at work or on Facebook or uh, through Twitter. Um, I, I don't know, it, it's uh, pretty gratifying and, and humbling to, to appreciate just how many people um, kind of cared what happened to me. And, and, and that's kind of a profound thing. Well, I think that for myself, um, I hope that my, my kids and, and uh, ultimately grandkids um, are able to have at least a good life as I've had and uh, um, that they'll uh, be good people and, and hopefully make the world a better place. Um, I think that's probably the, the primary thing that I would hope. I mean, I'm kind of a workaholic. I so much enjoy what I do um, that I'll spend huge amounts of time uh, learning new technologies and, and, and those things are ephemeral. Uh, you know, .NET, um, you know, Visual Basic, all these things come and go over time. And so if, if there's any one thing out of this, I think it's uh, maybe a better appreciation or, or a, a remembrance that, that you know, these things come and go, but your family doesn't and your friends don't. And uh, so there are some things that are, are much more permanent than just the, uh, the, the things that we sometimes focus too much on maybe um, in our careers. Um, all of my life, uh, I've had the philosophy that yeah, you got to work hard yeah, you know, and, and plan for retirement and all the other things that are, are there. And at the same time, you can't do that to the exclusion of, of uh, enjoying life while you have the chance.